But in all of the sadness, when you're feeling that your heart is empty and lacking, you've got to remember that grief isn't the absence of love. Grief is the proof that love is still there. Tessa Schaefer. You're listening to Writing Roots, brought to you by Aspen House Publishing. Welcome to Writing Roots. I'm Lee Hole. And I'm Lee Esses. Welcome to a brand new month and season 52 of Writing Roots. Exactly a year ago, we covered how to write very specific emotions, and it was really well received. There are so many different emotions out there, so many different things that we can cover. So we have a whole nother list that we're going to cover this month. Really dive into the specifics, what they are, how they differ from similar emotions, and of course, how to convey them on paper. You might have guessed by our opener that today we are talking about grief. Now we have addressed sadness on a more broad scale before, and we've also addressed how to kill your characters in a way that is really effective and moves the reader to tears as well. But grief is not these things. Grief can come for a variety of reasons and often comes in several different stages. And it is very specific how grief is represented and how people process and go through their grief. Those stages are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. That is the order of appearance, and that is a key signature of grief, is going through these stages. If you go out of order, it feels unnatural to your reader. When you need to write grief, there are things that you need to remember about grief. And most specifically, that is There is no timeline on actual grief. Unfortunately, for your readers and for your character, there kind of is a timeline. (laughs) The amount of time you spend going through these stages is a direct reflection of how important it was to your main character. If your main character loses a child and then goes through all five stages in one scene, I don't think your character actually cared that much about their child. That doesn't mean that you need to stall your story until the character works through all five stages. In many cases, they are still going to have to progress through the plot as they are working on their grief. Or at times, they're going to have to shove it aside and try to ignore it for a while while they face the bigger consequences. And then they have to come up against that huge wall of grief that they haven't processed yet. So you're going to want to overlap those emotions with the events of the plot. One thing that we do want to highlight is that grief and sadness aren't exactly the same thing. Sadness is often the result of missed opportunities or not being able to achieve certain things. While grief is loss, it is missing something that you should have had. I also want to point out that sadness tends to be something that is more obvious externally. If they're a cartoon character, they're frowning, they're crying, they're upset about something that is happening in their lives. Grief can be much more invisible. The character is still doing the thing, and then there are very specific symptoms that can be very unique to your character that burst out at seemingly random times as a reflection of the internal turmoil that's happening with grief. So how do you show this very big, very deep, very intricate emotion of grief? Often, one of the biggest indicators is a burst of emotion or action that feels almost out of character. The grandfather who has always hugged his children as best he could and dressed up as Santa Claus lashes out at something that seems mundane. This is often a sign of fear. It is that anger stage of grief where they're still in middle of processing everything. And some of that anger comes with a fear, an irrational fear that something similar is going to happen to another loved one. Say they lost a child and now they are aggressively protective over their other children. 
This burst of semi-erratic behavior also is a reflexive response and an emotional response instead of a logical response to a situation. In a slightly more healthy representation of somebody going through grief, you'll often see them having strange habits, things like singing, smiling at this particular flower that's blooming, or keeping a knife under the mattress because there was a home invasion and grief happened because of that. These are a little bit more logical, a little bit less main character energy, I guess. But these are still small indicators that can have a huge effect as far as conveying the internal struggle that the character is going through. I feel like this one often falls in that bridge between the depression and the acceptance, where these things make them sad, where it does bring them down, but they're getting to that acceptance where it's okay, where whistling this little tune gives them a reminder and doesn't hurt as badly anymore. Another one you'll see, especially with the older generation, in that phase is they stare off into space. There is something in their memories that is preferable to their current circumstance. This really falls into that denial where they are living in their minds in a state where the grief hasn't happened before they lost that very important part of themselves. So they are lost in thought because internally they are wanting to return to that other place and they refuse to accept that that other place that other time is not the present keep in mind that grief looks different for everyone the specific circumstances that your character went through in order to therefore experience grief will influence how they express their grief in your story Speaking as somebody who is very possibly neurodivergent and really struggles with object permanence when it comes to people, if I am not in direct contact consistently, sometimes I forget they exist. I know they exist, but I don't really. Grief is a really hard thing for me because sometimes I forget that they're gone. Some people think ADHDers are just really cold because they don't grieve consistently. So if you're like me and you're a plotter, knowing how your character grieves before you write the actual trigger of the grief can be a huge help in making sure that that hits hard and it stays hitting for the rest of the story. So understand if your character just likes humming songs, and there was this lullaby that grandma always used to sing, setting that up for how they grieve later can be a great payoff and really hit home for when you're writing this character in grief. So to get those triggers for grief that is going to make it really hit both the character and the readers, you really need to have, obviously, something that the character has lost. If they don't have that, it is not grief. It doesn't have to be a person. It doesn't have to be someone they were related to. It can be a loss of a limb. It can be the loss of a pet or the loss of an item that reminded somebody that they grieved a really long time ago and now their final link to them is gone. When a parent has a child that goes no contact and they don't understand, that triggers a grieving process, even though the child is still alive. Sometimes when you are writing grief, the reader doesn't actually have to know what they're grieving, but there does need to be something you as the author knows is in their backstory. And you can sprinkle it in, them going into these moments of depression and mentioning things here or there that will give the reader a hint at something much deeper that happened in the past. A great example of this is Uncle Iroh in Avatar The Last Airbender and his discussions about his son. And of course, the tragic song. We get the impression that he is trying really hard to be a father figure for Zuko. And we think that that's because Zuko doesn't have a real father figure and Iroh is stepping in to be that character. And to some extent, he is. 
But once we learn that that's because he lost his own son in the wars that the king is pushing on everyone, that relationship with Zuko becomes that much more heartbreaking. We don't know his backstory. We don't know what he's grieving until it's revealed much later on. And it's heartbreaking for the readers that way. When you are writing a character that's grieving and you have those five phases that the character is going through, the transition between phases, each of those should have a trigger. So if you want to transition from something like denial to anger, a really good trigger for that is actually seeing the body of the person who died that they're grieving. They don't believe it because they haven't seen the person dead. And now the body is in front of them in the morgue. They are clearly dead. There is no going back from it. And in that moment, their grief morphs from denial to anger because they can't deny it anymore. They have been faced with irrefutable proof. In the end, grief is a very powerful tool because a lot of your audiences have experienced grief in some way. It might be something small but it's something that will connect your readers with your characters if you do it with sincerity. So we very much encourage you to draw on your own experiences with grief and the way that you've reacted to things and the way you've seen other people react to grief. Pull on these instances when you're writing your story and then write selfishly. If you have a question or comment for our hosts or a topic you'd like us to cover, send us an email at writingroots at aspenhousepublishing.com or find us on Facebook by searching for Aspen House Publishing. 